I'm Corey Crenshaw. I'm Richie Suave Flores. And this is Sporty with Corey and Richie Suave. Center field, the Diamondbacks are world champions. Down is the motion man. Little flip to Fitzgerald, he scores! And the Cardinals win an amazing game. Mikael Bucker with a chance, he walks in, he scores! Mikael Bucker for the second straight game is the hero. What is going on, everybody, and welcome into episode number two, Sporty with Corey and Richie Suave. Happy to be back with you. We were off last week because of Father's Day, so I know you missed us, but I'm hope, hope, we hope you spent time with your dads on Father's Day last week. But we're back. Episode number two, and uh, Corey, before we get into what we're going to talk about, though, let's make sure everybody knows where to follow us on all of our social media sites. Well, we've got Twitter for our show, which is at Corey underscore Richie show. And then we have our individual ones. Mine's Corey Nicole with not one, but two. Yours? Mine is at rflores91. You can follow me on Twitter there because I have a lot of takes, yes. period, in sentence. And they're very hot takes <laughs> as you would like to put them i hope so yes indeed <laughs> yes and then we also have our facebook page which is the same name as the show and go ahead and give us a like because we <laughs> like you you should like us <laughs> don't forget to uh like and subscribe to us on on youtube as well that will be up in a couple of days hi if you're watching us and so listening to us on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts as well. But Corey, let's let's get into it. We have nothing to talk about this week, do we? I don't know how we're going to fill 45 minutes. Nothing's gone on in Arizona. Like, I don't even know why we're wearing these jerseys right now. And I don't know why mine says Doan <laughs> on the back of it, you know. It's just because we wanted, we felt like it's cool inside the building. So it's the one time during the entire summer of 120 degrees that we can wear Hockey sweaters. Oh my gosh, I'd be dying if I was wearing this outside. <laughs> exactly. But there is a legitimate reason why we are both wearing Coyote sweaters. Shane Doan for Corey. Mine, of course, is Tobias Reader. His number obsession. Eight. Yes, number eight in your score sheets. Number one in my heart. <laughs> Always. <laughs> of course. But uh, it was a big week for the Arizona Coyotes this week, Corey. A lot of news. We're going to get to all of it. But I think we need to start with probably what was the biggest bombshell that was dropped. And it happened... We heard about we first heard about it on Monday, but it happened really on Saturday, which is and this is going to be amazing. So amazing for me to see. I can't believe I'm about to say this. So hold on to your your chairs at home. Shane Doan is not going to be returning for his 21st season with the Arizona Coyotes. We have a new captain in town. Exactly. You won't be able to see any more <laughs> of the little Dones with his little bobbling head and his little cowboy hat. It's a very sad moment for all of Arizonans because Shane Doan really was a heart of this community. He did so many things to not only support hockey in Arizona, but to support Arizonans in general. So the fact that he is no longer going to be Captain Coyote is not only going to be a sad thing for my childhood, (laughs) but a sad thing for everyone in the state all in general. Yeah, we're going to get into that in just a little bit here, but and our thoughts on the move and whatnot. But let's kind of take people through what actually went down, how Shane found out about it and how he reacted. So he actually found out about this on Saturday, which was the same day that the Coyotes also traded Mike Smith to the Calgary Flames. So he found out about it just before that became public. And how this all went down, apparently, is that basically the new sole owner of the Coyotes, Andrew Barraway, made this decision. So what he decided to do is call up the general manager, John Chaika, in his second season as GM. And Chaika and Doan went out for a breakfast in Scottsdale, and Shane thought they were going to basically discuss kind of what was going on in the team, kind of check in with them and see how things were going and see what the plans were for the offseason and the draft. But that's not went down at all. So they sat down at this restaurant, First Watch in Scottsdale. It's a place that Shane Doan apparently is a big fan of. Used to be called the Good Egg. They're, they're, Angry about that. The same. There you okay. go. I've never been there. Maybe I'll make it out there now. But uh, So apparently they both walked into the restaurant about 9 a.m. And as soon as they sat down for this breakfast, Shane Doan had walked out seven minutes later because John Chaika had informed him that they would not be signing him to a contract 
for the season. Not the way things should have ended as far as Shane Doan's tenure with the Arizona Coyotes. He deserved so much better. It came off very crass, and it there were some rumors about it being about Doan's agent kind of dropping that he wanted to come back, and they thought that it might have been a forceful move to try and make him come back because the front office didn't really – they were kind of in the middle on him at the end of the season, so they're wondering if that could have been a factor into it. But he feels that Bearway was the sole person that really didn't want him back. And that, I think, really hurts because of the fact that Bearway has been the sole owner for, you know, maybe a minute. So (laughs) it's kind of hard to be like you now completely on the team with no one else. And now you get rid of Captain Coyote, who's been here since before the team was even in this state. Yeah. It just comes off really bad. And and not only that, too, that he just sent Chaika to basically do his work for him, but he sent out the press release. So we didn't find out about it. We found out about it on about Monday afternoon uh, last week. And it was just a press release, and it was literally just a statement from Andrew Barraway. There wasn't a statement from Shane Down in there, and it was literally – that's how we found out about it. It wasn't a big celebration. It was just like, oh, you're gone. Bye. Yeah, and there was a lot of questions. No one really knew what they had told Doan, what they had given him. It wasn't until a while later. I had actually gotten a few people asking me about it and what I thought, and it wasn't until later when people found out that they had offered him a position in the front office. And every other sport, when you have someone who is the face of that team and is the one that draws people into the crowd, like there's so many Doan jerseys out there. He is the sole person behind it, and the fact that they didn't have a good explanation of what they were going to do with him afterwards was not the best way to be doing it either. Yes, he has been offered that, but from what I've heard, he's been trying to see where else he can go. That's what I understand as well as in statements from him and his both his agent. He wants to play. He wants to play for a cup. Now, I don't know if he's going to get that shot anywhere. I don't personally think he's really got a lot left in him as far as a hockey player, considering he was indeed a pretty much a fourth-line player for the Coyotes last season, and that's where he probably was going to slot in this season as well. So I don't know what teams would be interested in adding a fourth-line player on a bad team into a fourth-line player on a good team. But, Corey, there was a lot of talk this week as well from people I saw. There was a few people on Twitter, maybe not a lot, but there were certainly a few who, when they saw this news come down, they overreacted too much, in my opinion. They basically went on Twitter and they said, oh, you're going to treat Shane Doan like that? Well, then I'm not going to be a fan anymore. Did you think think that was an overreaction too? Do you think it was fair? I mean, we understand he was the captain for 10 years. He's played with this team for for 20. But do you agree with some of these fans out there who, who are jumping ship all of a sudden? It's really rough. I don't think as a fan that you should be jumping ship. You should always be loyal with your team. But it's really hard to latch on to certain guys and to be taking that leadership and just getting rid of them one by one. It was huge when Keith Yandel left. My other jersey back at home Mm -hmm. is a Keith Yandel jersey. So um, it's really hard to take that leadership and completely remove them one by one and keep on breaking them down and building up a brand new team because the heart of what this – whole you know hockey community in Arizona as small as it is it's getting much bigger but the heart that they started with is starting to go away it could be a fresh new start it could be bringing all the new young fans into it and now that we're hitting this the people people who had grown up with the team they um are now having kids and raising their kids so it'll be these young players that'll inspire their children but I just don't think as a fan you can get that angry off of something like this. You can defend someone that you love so much, but you can't abandon ship altogether. Yeah, and uh, real quickly, do you think it was the right move on ice? Because I I think it was. Like I just explained, this guy, was a, he's, he's 40 years old. He just wasn't going to fit on, on this team. It was time for him to move on. He had one of the worst seasons of his career last season it, it, it was time this this team's getting younger especially with all the moves that they had accomplished this past week and we're going to talk about those a little bit later on but real quickly before we get to our, our favorite chain down memories do you think it was the right move on ice 
Sadly, I do. Um, I mean, on the ice, yes, play-wise, but for leadership, I'm worried about the leadership. This team is a very young and immature team, and we need someone who can really drive this team in the correct decision, in the correct direction. Apologies. Um, Domi was supposed to be there at some point, but I just don't feel like he's ready for it just yet. Yeah, all I recommend Larson is reportedly going to be named the new captain as we get into training camp. So he's been in the league for long enough. He seems to have that pedigree. He was under Shane Doan as an assistant captain for a while. So I think that's the right move. But real quickly, we don't have a lot of time left in this segment. Let's get into this. This is very important too as well. Let's get into some of our favorite memories of Shane Doan. We both have a lot of them. Yeah, we. Uh, my favorite one, honestly, um, was as being a PR intern and being up there watching um, his 400th goal because they were playing Toronto and everyone was hyping up Austin Matthews mm-hmm. coming home. And it was just beautiful that it wasn't a very good game for the Coyotes, those of you who were there and remember it. Um, but seeing Doan do that and everyone rally behind him was amazing. There's still a packed house, not just because of Austin Matthews, but because of the fact that it was going to be his 400th goal and his 1500th. Well, um, if I'm getting these all <laughs> numbers all jumbled up. 1500th game. Yeah. Yeah. 1500th game. Thank you. I'm tongue tied today. <laughs> I don't know why so many don't things it's making me tongue tied, <laughs> but yeah, that was my favorite memory. And I think for me, mine's a pretty simple one, which is I'll never forget how loud the building was when he scored his very first hat trick against the New York Islanders. Uh, It came with maybe basically at the buzzer. And uh, he got that first hat trick against the New York Islanders. And it was amazing. I'll never forget being there that moment. And basically the entire third period, all of his teammates were trying to get him the puck. I believe the Coyotes dropped the puck with about mm, 15 seconds or so left in the game. And they came in across the blue line with about six left. And somehow, some way, the, Riz- the wizard, Ray Whitney, got him the puck. And Shane scored right at the buzzer. And Jobby.com Arena at the time went nuts. And that was awesome. And for me, that's always going to be my number one Shane Doan moment. However, not everyone can be like our beloved Shane Doan. Some people are just dicks. So we got to go to Richie's Dick of the Week. Thank you very much, Corey. It is, of course, time for my favorite segment of the show. It is time for Richie's Dick of the Week. This is where I yell at people because they've been complete a-holes throughout the week or they do something stupid and they deserve being called out on this here show. This week, I have two nominees. Not one, but two. So earlier this week, the NBA draft was held and Lonzo Ball went number two overall to the LA Lakers and Josh Jackson went number four overall to the Phoenix Suns. Both good picks for those organizations. Alonzo Ball is going to do great things in L.A. with him and his father. It's going to be wonderful. Big baller brand, all that garbage. Josh Jackson, of course. I actually really like that pick as well to the Suns. It's exactly what they needed. But I'm going to give my dick of the week to them for something they did off the court and on the diamond. So Josh Jackson and Lonzo Ball both threw out first pitches for the Diamondbacks and the Dodgers. And things did not go so well for either of them. For Lonzo Ball, he took to the hill at Dodger Stadium, and he proceeded to throw what I like to call a lob pass. Looks like he was lobbing the ball for an alley-oop instead of actually throwing like an actual pitcher. You would think as an athlete you'd be able to throw and look like you belong on the pitcher's mound. Both of these guys didn't. And if you thought Lonzo Ball's throw was bad, how about Josh Jackson? He steps up to the mound with the Arizona Diamondbacks after he was drafted, and he proceeds to throw the ball looking like a five-year-old. He looks like he never picked up a baseball a day in his life, and he threw, trying to throw the ball to Archie Bradley at home plate, he ended up missing him by about 15 feet to the right. Looks like he was aiming for somebody in the stands instead of actual home plate. Once again, these guys are high-class athletes. They're going to kill it in the NBA. They're both going to be all-stars. They're both going to be really great for their teams. But come on, guys. You're athletes. Get it together. Learn how to throw a freaking pitch. Josh Jackson and Lonzo Ball, you gentlemen are both this week's Dicks of the Week. That was a pretty good Dick of the Week there. (laughs) I mean, I seriously thought it was going to hit someone on the complete right side of the field. So, um... Next time, everyone just knows to wear helmets around him. It's okay. (laughs) I mean, everyone needs a helmet every once in a while. Just never thought it would be during a first pitch of a baseball game. But, hey, I mean, 
We also have a lot of other things that have been going on other than people almost getting knocked out on baseball fields. We also have the departure of Tippett on our hands. So going back to hockey, how are you feeling about what went down with Tippett? Yeah, so I was actually live on the air with uh, with the Freaks earlier this week uh, when this news went down. And uh, it was I, – I completely saw it coming. I, I knew – that it was time for him to go. I love Dave Tippett. I think he's a great coach, but I don't think he was the right fit for this team at this time. I don't think he's a coach that really fits young players well. When he was successful here, um, he was coaching a team made up of pretty much completely veteran players. So after five straight seasons of missing the playoffs, I know it sucks, but it was time to move on uh, from Dave Tippett. Yeah, I mean – Technically, over his eight seasons, he he was 282, 257, and 83. He had three playoff appearances, but you're correct. He went through five straight seasons without a playoff run. And it just kind of came to a point where you can't keep your job if you're losing. You can't have losing seasons and keep staying at the same status that you were before. And the biggest problem that I think he has is you had kind of mentioned it, he does not ha- know how to coach younger, faster teams. And his old style is just going out. We've seen year after year, particularly the past two years, the Pittsburgh Penguins with their fast feet winning uh, Stanley Cups. We can't see the same thing coming out of Tippett. And so I could kind of see this coming. But the strange thing is actually how it happened. Chica wanted him to stay. Mm-hmm. And he kind of just said, you know, I don't really feel comfortable with the situation. He, for a long time, was in charge of doing most of the stuff for the team. He had a lot of say-so with the team. So I think that Barraway has so much say-so now, he didn't really want to be a part of it. He didn't think it was a very good situation for him. So he decided to leave, and it became more of a mutual breakup, so to say. So I was kind of surprised it went that way. I kind of thought they are just going to get rid of him altogether, but I think most of us saw this coming. Yeah, and the thing, too, is is with Dave Tippett, I mean, I understand where people are coming from where, I mean, I've talked to, to friends and people on air, Jody Ayler, who has to drive uh, on my station, Fox Sports 910, where it's kind of like when when you thought of Shane Doan, when you thought of Dave Tippett, that was the things that you knew, that you kind of almost held dear in a way. And now that those things are gone, it's a big change for fans, but – it's it comes down it comes down to winning, Corey. I mean that's really what it's all about. And so when you get some new blood in here and a new coach and obviously new players, and we're gonna get to the trades that the county's made uh, here in, in just a little bit. Um, I thought that this was really the the only move. And the thing that sucks about it is you know apparently there was some some things going on between Tippett and Barraway. Apparently their relationship wasn't all that great. And again, we talked about Barraway at the top of the show. It, He's still a wild card to me. We'll see what happens. I mean, I, I, all I care about is what happens on the ice. And I think that's what it comes down to with the Dave Tippett firing is what's happening on the ice and getting this team to win. Yeah, I don't particularly disagree with the situation. I think it was coming no matter what. However, the coaching job in itself is viewed as toxic. Amongst all of the Coaches Guild, they all think that it's a toxic situation and that could be a problem for any coaches that they try to bring in. Chaika obviously is focusing on the trades that he has made um, before the draft, but that will be his next focus. And I feel like that's going to be slightly difficult to him. I don't know how long it'll be or what type of quality of coach there will be coming in, but there have been a few that have been tossed around. Yeah, there's a couple that I've seen, and, and the one I've been pushing for, certainly, and you mentioned the Pittsburgh Penguins and their Stanley Cup winning pedigree, is Dan Bilesma is the first name that came to mind for me. Dan Bilesma was, of course, the coach of the Pittsburgh Penguins when they won their first Stanley Cup with Sidney Crosby. He was, was of course, then fired by the Penguins, and they brought in some some new blood there. But he then went on to the Buffalo Sabres. He was with them for two seasons. And for whatever reason, things just went south between him and their superstar player, Jack Eichel. But I think Don Bosmo brings a Stanley Cup pedigree, and that is, to me, something that this team needs. They need to bring in somebody who is a proven winner, who has been there and done that before, 
And they did they did that with one of the trades, bringing in Nicholas Jarmelson, Jarmelson, who's a three-time Stanley Cup champion. And we'll get to that trade again in a little bit. But I think Dan Bausma, he's coached young players before. Again, he's won that Stanley Cup. I think he's somebody that I'd really like to see him and how he fits in with a very young group and young core that the Coyotes have. I agree. I think with his checkered track record that he, you know, he is still very hungry and he wants to take a team that is so young and has so much pure talent that we either traded for or is coming up in our system they he's very hungry for a team like that and he would do very well with this team it's just the matter of whether he wants to step into this position and he wants to have someone watching over his shoulder all the time and kind of pushing him in decisions and whether he really wants to deal with that or not is something completely personal that I think you know everyone hears rumors and everyone hears certain things that you know us as the press don't exactly hear all the time Mm -hmm. and I say there's a lot of things underneath that top layer that are going on that we really can't say what's happening but it'll be really interesting to see what comes out of it yeah I think that's uh, something that owner relationship with their hockey ops is something that's really interesting to me and you see it in other sports too in terms of owners that you know basically stick their hand in too much and I think that's something that Barraway now as being the sole guy I think he he's gonna learn that listen he needs to give autonomy to the hockey ops department to his head coach to his GM to run the hockey ops Barraway and his group and their CEOs can run the business ops and I think that's something that that they're gonna get used to and they're gonna learn and they have to learn it pretty quick because they're learning on the fly however Yeah, sadly, it could take a season for that to balance out. You know, every relationship has that middle period where they're trying to figure out whose positions what and who wants to go in what direction. So there might be some working out there that needs to be done, which is kind of sad because we'd rather get off on the ground running this next season. But especially with the instability of the team, but it might take a season for them to really figure out where they all want to be and where they all mesh the right way. Yeah, and real quick before we uh, we take a little break here, uh, Todd Nelson is another name that I've seen. He used to coach the Edmonton Oilers. He's apparently going to have a chat with Chaika and with Barraway, and they're going to interview him here in the next week or so. Uh, he won the Stan- he won the AHL Calder Cup with Grand Rapids this past season, so he's going to be a name to watch for as well. But Corey, coming up next, though, we are going to get into those trades, trades, trades. There was a bunch of them as far as the Arizona Coyotes are concerned in the past week. But before we do that, it was Star Wars Day out of the ballpark at the Arizona Diamondbacks uh, this past Saturday. And so I think in honor of Star Wars, how about we draft our own Star Wars roster of baseball players? Being a Star Wars nerd myself, this sounds like a lot of fun, and uh, you know my man Chewie will be in there somewhere. <laughs> Corey, I have a, a feeling that Chewbacca is going to show up somewhere in my in our lists, but um, here's what's going to happen. So we picked nine Star Wars characters, and we matched them each with a position on a baseball diamond. And so we each drafted our picks. Corey, you picked five positions. I picked four. And we're going to do this kind of draft style, and... Corey, you were on the clock with the number one pick in the Sporty with Corey and Richie Suave Star Wars character baseball draft. I'm going to start with the dark side, as it were, and my pitcher is going to be Darth Vader because he has no problem hitting someone. So if you are a good player, if you are a Nolan Arenado, he will not have a problem (laughs) hitting you and taking you out of the game because he's Vader and he's ruthless and he tells you not to choke on your aspirations. (laughs) So I would choose Vader as my pitcher, and my number two would be my other main man, Yoda, because Yoda is just amazing in every way. He's going to be your catcher. Yeah, because he's short. (laughs) Come on. like He is prime. The way that he is level-wise is perfect for the strike zone. I I think he can be a good pitch framer. Yeah, I mean, he can't really move it around much more. Like he, He doesn't have very long arms. So at least any time he catches it, it has to be somewhere in the strike zone. <laughs> and I mean, he can always use the force to bring it back into the strike zone. That's so true. he's a master Jedi. <laughs> I like that. I like that battery. One and two. I'm going to continue things here. Our, my third overall pick in the Star Wars draft is going to be first baseman 
Chewbacca. He, of course, is uh, pretty big, so he, we know he's got the power. We know he's not nimble. You don't have to be too nimble to play first base. So the power combination, along with the uh, not too great defensive abilities, he is going to be my first baseman. Okay. We, we had to put a chewy noise in there. <laughs> there Come on. Go. That was my best chewy noise. I can dig it. All right. Well, how about making this noise as well? Because my number four overall pick in the Star Wars draft, my second baseman, because he is so mobile. Not for his hitting. He's pretty tiny. But I feel like he's going to be really mobile and able to play the second base position really well. He'll have a small s- strike zone. Yes. BB-8 playing second base. I, I think that's pretty good. I don't know <laughs> what exact noises BB-8 makes. He, uh, he makes a little, like... Beep, boop, beep, boop. Those type of ones. And he takes a lighter to give you a thumbs up. <laughs> but outside of that, I don't really know BB-8 noises. Sorry, people. <laughs> um, My next pick would be Darth Maul. Yes, I am going to the dark side again with Darth Maul because I feel like he will be ruthless at third base. So you get in a pickle... Can you imagine getting in a pickle between Darth Maul and Yoda? (laughs) It's going to be one of the most exciting things of your entire life. You either have a Jedi Master that you're afraid of or a Sith that you're afraid of. So, I mean, I think it's pretty good. My next one would be Center, and it would be Rey, because we all saw her running through the sand. She can book it. Girl has legs. She can run as fast as she can. She can run all over that outfield. So she is my center fielder. Plus, she's captain of the Millennium Falcon now as well. So we know she'd be able to captain a defense in center field. So I'm going to move back to the infield before we move back to the outfield. My shortstop is, of course, going to be Han Solo. I feel like he'd be a very smooth hitting shortstop. I feel like he's light on his feet. I don't know why, but... Maybe because he knows how to fly the Millennium Falcon. Because going... he's always stealing things and running away or... There you go. Yeah, he'd be a good beast, ba- a base stealer as well. So <laughs> Han Solo is going to be my shortstop. And then I also have left field. So I'll move on to left field. And I had to do this. I don't know if this is the greatest pick in the world. People are going to yell at me. But uh, with the passing of Carrie Fisher, I had to put Leia in the lineup. So she is going to be my left fielder. The things you think people are going to say, are are they going to say that she's whiny? Because that is the most common complaint is that she's whiny. <laughs> so she'll be like, it's too hot. I don't want to play that field. She's a general now, man. Yeah. yeah. Oh, true. I mean, oh, so are we doing general Leia or are we doing princess Leia? I just have Leia on there. So pick, pick your choice. Right. She can be whatever you want her to be. Well, that brings to my right field choice, which is young obi-wan see i chose young obi-wan because i feel like older obi-wan doesn't have the mobility that young obi-wan had and he's much more optimistic he thought that anakin could be a good person i mean that was before he dumped him in a bunch of lava and turned him into vader but you know (laughs) um he had a lot of optimism i think he could bring good spirit to the team so i choose a young obi-wan for right field There you go. So that is our lineup, uh, one through nine. Again, Vader, Yoda, Darth Maul, Rey, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Chewbacca, BB-8, Han Solo, and, of course, Leia Organa. So that's our nine. Of course, I think we're going to ask. Yes, send us in your lineups, and next show we will choose one lineup that we thought was the best, and we will tell you all who won don't forget to put your Twitter handle out there. Give yourself a shout out. And uh, yeah, there's go to any of our social medias and send us in a DM. Slide into our DMs and uh, let us know who you would have as your lineup. Corey, though, I think we did miss one really good Star Wars character in that we have been getting some feedback from our producers behind the scenes that we may have missed Jabba the Hutt. Yes, so you'll definitely have to put Jabba somewhere in your lineup. That is a requirement because during our little break we took here, um, our producers and crew were telling us that Jabba the Hutt was left out and that you can't do such a thing because then you will end up being on his wall in his hut. So, um, yeah, don't make Jabba the Hutt mad. (laughs) Speaking of making people mad, Corey, there were some... 
Dave Tippett's firing and Shane Doan's um, no longer with the Coyotes, obviously. So that made people mad. Mm-hmm. But there were some things that did make people happy this week, too, including myself. It got me super excited. Uh, earlier this week, the Coyotes made three separate trades. They dealt away Mike Smith, and they also acquired a couple of players. Uh, Corey, what, can you recap for us the trades that were made by the Arizona Coyotes this week? Yes. So they have acquired center Derek Stepan and goaltender Antti Ranta. And sorry if any of this is pronounced incorrectly. <laughs> we worked on it before the show, but you never know coming out of my <laughs> mouth. And um, that was an exchange for defenseman Anthony D'Angelo and uh, Coyote's seventh overall pick in the 2017 NHL draft. That was um, yesterday or right yesterday. It was on Friday and Friday. Saturday. That's what yes. I'm my days of the week are all blending together. People <laughs> I was I still keep on thinking this is Saturday, not Sunday. <laughs> Apologize. And then um, the Coyotes also acquired defenseman Nicholas Jalmerson from the Blackhawks in exchange for defenseman Connor Murphy and forward Laurent Dauphin, or well as done. we like to call him Dolphin. Yes. Because it's funny and it's easier to say. <laughs> so I I gotta say, I was expecting these trades to happen after especially after the departure of Mike Smith. They had a big hole open at their goal tank position, and Mike Smith was dealt to the Calgary Flames for Chad Chad Johnson uh, earlier in the week. So they had that goaltending position open, and they were bringing in now Auntie Ranta to replace him. And, Corey, I really like this acquisition. Auntie Ranta coming over from the New York Rangers. He was the backup to Henrik Lundqvist for most of the season, for the last couple seasons, and he did get some starting time when Henrik was hurt for a couple weeks last year, and he put up really good numbers. There are some people out there who say, well, he's not really a starter. Can he really be that number one starter? And I think he can. I actually pulled some numbers from last season for Antti Rana, and this is really, really good. So he was actually top 10 in both save percentage and goals against average with goalies who started 30 or more games. And not only that, but he was the goalie who had the most or the highest quality start percentage. And quality start percentage basically says um, if you allow three goals or less in a game or you will allow, I believe, one goal or less, depending on shots. So it's just a, a measure of how well your starts are going. He was the best goaltender in that metric last season as well. What R- Ronta kind of reminds me of, Corey, is that when the Coyotes first brought in Mike Smith in his very first season, we weren't really sure what he was all about. We were questioning whether or not he could really be a number one goaltender. He was coming over from the Dallas Stars, and he was just waiting to get that shot to prove that he was a number one goaltender. And I think that's what we're going to get with Antti Ranta here. He's coming over, and he's finally going to get a shot to prove that he's a true number one, and I think he's going to be pretty successful at it. He also hasn't had the support of being a number one goaltender. Um, He was around for a cup, at least, and... um, he in that one he wasn't even put on to the cup itself and that was definitely a drawback when he left and it was much better when he came to New York it's a much more amicable leave but um one of the things you were talking about uh Mike Smith leaving is the fact that Smith is 35 and uh Ronta is 28 and since this team is going towards so much of a younger dynamic it could be that Smith was just kind of getting too old, getting not necessarily comfortable because every time he got comfortable, he would get injured. So it was kind of at a point where he kind of needed to go and they're trying to get someone newer, kind of more experienced in playoffs coming in and playing with this team. So I think it was a very good move. How do you feel about uh, Stefan? Uh, so, yeah, so Stepan was acquired from the Rangers as well, and I I love – this was the part of the trade that I really loved because Derek Stepan is a guy who played on the top line for the New York Rangers, um, and they were one of the best goal-scoring teams in the league. I believe they finished top five in goals four in the NHL last season. And Derek Stepan is a guy who you know exactly what you're going to get from him. He's going to put up at least 50-plus points like he has for the last four seasons, and he is a guy who can play a 200-foot game – he has some some 
he can play the penalty kill. He can play on the power play. He's good in his own zone. Um, and he's going to step in to the Arizona Coyotes, and he's going to be their number one defenseman that they've been looking for for quite a while. So he's basically more or less replacing Martin Hansel in the lineup. Martin Hansel was the number one center for many, many years here. And now Derek Stepan is going to be that guy. And I think Derek Stepan has – the thing that makes him different from Marty Hansel is that Stepan has a lot more offensive upside than Marty Hansel did. Marty Hansel was a guy who's only going to get you, you know, maybe 10 goals, 15 assists a season, but he made himself worth it because of his penalty killing abilities. But with Stepan, he's going to bring the offense and and he's going to bring it playing alongside like guys like Max Domi and and um, uh, Anthony Duclair as well. My apologies, Duke. I apologize for that. Um, but he's he's in a perfect position here with the Coyotes, I think, to succeed. Yeah, he has had at least 53 points in the last four seasons. So he can definitely put up the points, and he is one of the most significant people on their team when it comes to minutes on the power play and the penalty kill. So he is definitely a well-rounded player, and he brings in a lot of excitement. And not to say anything bad about Hansel, but uh, Chaika had put out a statement saying that they, um, we are thrilled to acquire Derek. Our organization has been searching for a true number one center for over a decade, and we are confident that he can be that for us. That's something that Chaika coming in, I know he really wanted to find that number one center that he could really rely on. Um, I'm not 100% positive he will be as good as he was in – New York just because of the fact of the type of dynamics and chemistry on the team you never really know how he'll feel scoring wise um in that position moving to a team that is so kind of new at this point because there are so many changes made to the team um in like on the team itself Mm -hmm. as well as the you know the coaching change so it'll, it'll be interesting to see how he fits in with all of it, but he definitely has the potential to be such a great leader and great scorer on this team. And one of the things too, is he's under contract for quite a while. I believe he has uh, his contract runs for another three seasons at about six and a half million dollars. So we know he's going to be here for a while playing on that top line with those young guys. He's going to be exciting to watch uh, for the Coyotes this coming season. Hopefully he's probably going to wear, I'm assuming get a letter, probably be an assistant captain or something like that to know all of Reckman Larson as well. Yeah, I mean, he has the ability to, and he's been such a leader in all of the other ways that I could definitely see that. Um, going on to Jalmerson, I'm not trying to <laughs> screw this one up. We like we went between videos here because people are – pronouncing it Yalmerson and Jalmerson. So I'm trying to figure out which one it is particularly. I'm pretty sure it's Jalmerson, but don't sue me on it. But um, he is another one coming in that will really be a huge difference for this team because for a long time, speaking of OEL, he has needed a D pairing that has really been a marriage for him where he can really feel confident with it on the ice. And they played together in not only the World Cup, but in the 2014 Olympics, I think it was. And so, yeah, the 2014 Winter Olympics. So they've had experience together. They are, you know, both from the same area of the world. And they just have such an ability to really balance each other out. And he had been quoted saying, uh, talking about OEL, he's one of the better D-men in the league. So hopefully I can compliment him with just playing my style of hockey at the same time, maybe to develop a little bit more of a puck moving element to my game and be more involved offensively. But at the same time, playing defense has always been my strength and that's what I'm expecting from myself. And that's great with OEL because OEL is such an offensive defenseman. Yeah, so that's one. Of, that's the important thing here is you have to remember that Nicholas Jalmerson is a left-hand shot, but he's been playing on the right side um, with the Blackhawks on the top pairing with Duncan Keith. So if he's able to play with Alderac Larson, it's a very nice balance like you talked about. Jalmerson is a guy who is a top pairing shot-blocking defenseman that this team hasn't had really since Zabinik McCulloch was at the top of his game uh, under Dave Tippett in those three years that they were making the playoffs. So this is huge for Oliver Ekman-Larsen. He's going to be able to come in 
and he's going to be able to basically be let loose because he doesn't have to focus so much on the defensive side of his game. So he can focus on doing what he does so well, which is put the puck in the back of the net. And Exactly. Uh, yeah, we had a lot of, lot of trades happening this week, but uh, I think we're going to go ahead – and and cap it there. We can, can we can talk about this for three hours if you wanted to, Corey. But it is time now, I believe, for the big moment of the show that we've all been waiting for. Let's take a step into Corey's corner. This week for Corey's corner, I want to go a little bit more nicer and talk about people like our Captain Coyote, forever and always, twenty seasons strong. I know too soon, but um, talk about athletes like him it can sometimes be overwhelming and it can be a lot to handle as an athlete who is being showered with admiration and money and just being in the spotlight all the time and having everyone expect so much out of you however there are athletes that come out and do wonderful things with this stardom and our Shane Doan was one of those that always set the tone of being the perfect gentleman in situations, always being there for the media, always being there for kids, all the little howlers out there. He always set the greatest tone, and he made such a difference in this community. Not all of your job is about being on the ice or on the field or whatever it may be. It's also about being there for the fans because the fans are what make it make you what you are and make your sport what it is. If there wasn't fans buying tickets, you wouldn't be able to play the the game that you love as a professional sport. So I want to say a thank you to all of the athletes who are like Doan and to Doan. Thank you from everyone in Arizona for all that you've done for us in our community because you went the extra length that you didn't have to go to, but you knew that the fans were an important part and you couldn't let your career go by without saluting the fans. So Shane Doan, we salute you. And we would like to also say, stay sporty and stay Doney. Good night, everybody. And good hockey. For Richard.